Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Sally Spencer Thomas. I am president of United Suicide Survivors and I'm really grateful you're here and super excited for our conversation today. Uh, the suicidal risk stigma, seeking SUD treatment with Dr. Marlon Rollins. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit more about United Suicide Survivors International. Thanks so much, Sally, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. United Suicide Survivors International, our, our vision, first and foremost, is we really hope to see a day when we are no longer necessary. Um, but until that day comes, we are dedicated to making sure that we bring all voices of lived experience to the conversations around suicide and suicide prevention. And our mission is to try to make sure for all efforts around learning, advocacy, that those voices are being uh, accurately and fairly represented at all tables. And I think I'm turning it over to Rick. Yeah. All right, so I get to talk to you about some of the programs that United Survivors is involved with. And uh, I'll go through those. The first one is we are involved with the workplace guidelines for workplace suicide prevention. Um, we also have some online courses about storytelling on Udemy. These courses help you determine if you're ready to share your story and help develop ways to share your story. Um, and we also have a series of books that are, we're involved with called Guts, Grit, and the Grind, a mental health manual for men's mental health. So far, volumes one through three are out and available, and they're working on volume four right now. And then last but not least, we have these monthly webinars we try to focus on very relevant topics in suicide prevention and always incorporating lived experience. With that, I'll turn it back over to Sally. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and so I'm just going to cover some housekeeping items, and I'm uh, hopefully going to be able to turn it over to Ursula to introduce our guest, um, because I'm going to have a sharing challenge if not. So housekeeping. Um, we are recording. And the recording, um, once we do a little light editing, will end up both on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if you have friends or colleagues that weren't able to join us tonight, that's where you'll be able to find the recording. Um, you are muted because we are in webinar mode, but we do want to hear from you most definitely. So please, please put your questions, comments, uh, curiosities, whatever in the chat, and we'll do our best to um, answer them as they come up. Um, let's see, anything else I want to share? Um, we're going to talk a little bit more at the end also about United Survivors and how you might want to get involved. Um, and with that, I'm just going to see if Ursula is in a position to introduce our guest. Um, well, our guest, we have a number of guests. We have our primary speaker, but we also have um, a new member of our team. Um, this is Jen Matoni, and um, I'd just like to introduce Jen. And Jen, can you say what your new role is on United Survivors? Yes, hi. So I am the Associate Director of Communications and Programs, and I'm going to be helping out with the storytelling retreats and social media and webinars and the Workplace Suicide Prevention Program. Pleased to be here. Well, welcome, Jen. We're thrilled you're here. All right, so now we'll get started with our main attraction, Dr. Marlon Rollins. Um, we are thrilled to say that he is our most recent board member of United Suicide Survivors International. And he brings um, with us, uh, to us a, a number of uh, decades of expertise in substance use uh, disorder recovery, um, including being um, very much involved in zero suicide, uh, SAMHSA efforts. He's been on the advisory committee for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and so much more. And with that, we'll turn it over to you, Marlon. Thank you so much for presenting to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to have you. And if, if you can just back up to the last slide, um, I just want to make sure that uh, people have an opportunity even now uh, to tweet on Twitter um, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram for United Survivors. Um, uh, again, we really want to make sure that we have a supportive community. Uh, and if you want to know more about the organization and what we're doing today, uh, please uh, join with us. And if you've been impacted by suicide loss or an attempt survivor, uh, we're here to support you. So again, that's what this message really is about, is creating community of uh, striking through some of the conversation. 
And the reason that we're talking today about kind of the suicide risk, and I put that in, in quotes or air quotes, or is because it's it, in working in the SUD um, uh, programs and working in behavior health, as was mentioned, uh, specifically in psych services, there was always this divide between talking about suicidality uh, in the world of um, substance use disorder or alcohol use or any drug addiction um, and the stigma that goes along with seeking tr treatment. And this is a conversation that really struck me in working in both sectors that um, I've realized need to be more addressed. Um, so that's the kind of topic you can we can get into the reason why and get to the next slide. So these are really the learning objectives. Again, I wanna help us, the audience today, really understand the barriers surrounding substance use disorders and help seeking uh, when there is suicidality as part of uh, a person's experience um, to kind of normalize that and starting to open up to have that conversation. Because just the term that we understand with suicidality or suicide period creates a lot of fear, uh, not just in the community, but with the providers themselves as well and knowing how to manage through that and what does it mean to really help somebody and have that really difficult conversation. So I'm gonna talk through some key points about managing suicide risk and assessing properly in rehab treatment um, and strategies for managing uh, the care, coordinating people who are high risk in suicide and making sure we don't have those treatment breaks um, as someone is going through getting the help that they need in the healing process and provide the support they need. And again, I hope that the audience, um, as you're thinking through, I've tried to talk some in layman's terms as well, because I realized that uh, we don't always fully rely on just the healthcare systems, but it's also responsibility within the community. Uh, and it's our loved ones that we're looking after that we're concerned about and um, how do we trust um, that they're gonna get the support that they need. So I'm gonna give you kind of both sides of what the mirror looks like. Um, so these are the programs I just wanna share with the group too that I oversee, I'm the CEO of um, Sierra by the Sea, which is in Newport Beach, California and um, Sunrise Ranch in Riverside, California. Uh, the websites there are listed and we specialize in substance use treatment. Um, so just as a point of reference, I just want you to understand what I do today. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more and giving some examples of my experience coming through uh, with suicide prevention initiatives, as well as working in healthcare. You can go to the next slide. Um, I think this first thing that I, I always wanna share with folks too, especially when we're having such an important conversation is to understand my why. And I think being part of United Survivors and a board member. And again, thank you for all um, the board members for embracing me and being a friend to me and support um, and allowing also for me to share my story. Um, I have an older sister, her name's Amber Rose Rollins, who, uh, who died by suicide uh, in 2013. In fact, it was December, um, December 31st was uh, the, the day that she left this earth. And uh, the picture on the left that you see, uh, and I think we're talking a lot about nurses, uh, especially in the last couple of years and their health care and their well-being and how important they are and what they mean to the community. And she obviously was an important person to a lot of people. Um, and I took this picture myself. We used to work together in the same hospital and I would be down in emergency rooms doing my assessments of patients coming in with behavioral health concerns. And uh, she would be on the floor and I would go up after I would finish you know, my rounds and sit with her and do my notes. So I took this picture on the left, that was um, about 2011. On the right, her and I are actually taking this picture in 2012 in December, right around the end of December. And um, yeah, so it was a very difficult loss and you know, it always comes, the holidays are always tough. I think anybody who's ever lost anyone around the holidays uh, you think about the loved one that you maybe have lost. And so a year later, my sister passed away and she was struggling with um, a, a drug issue um, and also a mental health issue. And, um, and I tell her story and I always consider her being a part of what this means for me and doing the work that I do. Um, so it's important to me that Amber Rose Rollins is a part of my story and she always will be. And uh, just know that, uh, that she's with me and I, I just appreciate you guys allowing me to, um, to share a little bit of her story today with you. So next slide. So, and I uh, recently published a book this year that tells a little bit more. Uh, I know the group will talk a little bit more about it but it is available on Amazon or on my website um, to talk here a little bit more about her story and more importantly about healing you can find only for yourself. So it is an inspirational memoir. Um, so thank you. So let's get into it. I mean, um, again, this is really um, 
a, a public health issue and one that unfortunately that we have not talked enough about. Um, and as we've seen COVID kind of take over, we've heard about the opiate, uh, the pandemic um, or epidemic that we're dealing with. And we also need to continue to address the issue of suicide. Uh, again, we look at the stats and they're a little bit staggering uh, as we've seen suicide deaths continue to rise in our communities. Uh, again, 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, we know that men die at a rate of 3.6 times more higher than, than, um, than women, but women are 1.4 time, times more likely to attempt suicide. So there's a cost of our community about each death suicide is about $1.3 million, um, putting the cost at about $69 billion annually, uh, about the combined uh, work loss, medical loss. Uh, we talk about the high risk groups, our veterans, uh, our caretakers, which I'm gonna address as well. Um, and also that it's not uncommon for people to have suicidal thoughts. Uh, I know the number there says 10.3%, but I've heard people reference up to 70% of us have had at some point thought about suicide and it's a different thing of actually getting to the point where you attempt but the notion is that it's part of the human experience to consent consider our life and death and depending on what's going around around at the time obviously we're dealing with very difficult times that we're living in in this nation and it's a conversation we need to talk about openly and feel good about getting support that we leave so we can save more lives um so again, um, just kind of a summary of some key points. Second leading cause of death, you're gonna find this all over if you do your little research on it. Uh, I think it's important to also understand as much as you see on TV about homicides, 2.5 times more suicides than homicides. And, uh, and I want people to be grasped a little bit by the data to recognize that these are our, uh, these are our family, these are our friends. This is, this is why um, United Survivors is here, and this is ideally why we don't want it to be here, is because we need to talk more about this and educate about how to get resources. Um, again, the statistical difference between males and females is an important one. Uh, lethal means, um, there are some gender differences also across different groups, and 85% of suicide deaths are happening in the home, so it's very traumatic. This is not typically happening in hospitals and facilities, but people are in their homes. Um, and we, that's where we've got to be able to have this conversation to make sure our homes are safe um, and they have support in the homes as well. Next slide, please. So as we talk about suicide, suicide deaths, uh, we know that over 50% of them are by firearms because of lethal means. But there's also this subject of uh, um, suicide overdose. Um, again, you're seeing, if you look at this trajectory here to your left, um, on the screen about the frequency of deaths uh, by suicide, and that that the sh time has shortened year over year. And I think in 2020, we're about every 10 minutes, somebody dies by suicide, suicide in this country. Uh, and that's an important thing for us to be thinking about is that this should be a longer length of time, not a short one. And globally, every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide. Um, you know, again, these are sad stories, but the notion is I want people to understand we have to have this conversation so we begin to do something about it. Um, and notion that the poisoning overdoses, some of those overdose deaths that we're seeing, they may be suicides, but we don't know. Uh, but there's definitely some interplay um, uh, between the two of them. Um, and again, pointing out the opiate use uh, that has been on the rise as well that's contributing to this. Please, next slide. So again, the suicide and drug overdose deaths in the United States have increased since 2001. We know that. And now we're seeing drug overdose deaths surpass suicide in 2015 and so on. So, and we're not seeing any much change in these numbers. We're moving in the wrong direction. And uh, so we really do want to make a call to action about saving lives. So the last thing is that we want to see um, people like Amber and our brothers and sisters that, um, and fathers and mothers too, uh, that are not able to live on. So we, got, we have to talk about what does it mean when somebody's struggling with uh, suicidal thoughts and a drug addiction. And next slide. So I bring this slide up in particular uh, because I want to talk a little bit about the patient experience and I think, or the person experience. And um, what really pushed me to get into the drug addiction and substance use and recovery field is because when my sister was struggling uh, with a mental health issue, um, she really struggled to also have to now deal with the idea of having a drug addiction and the label that came out of the stigma of mental health, plus now the stigma of somebody saying that you're addicted to a substance 
um, addicted to an opiate and what that meant for her as a nurse and how she identified as a mother um, and the notion of seeking services and the stigma again that comes along with that. Um, I worked in uh, originally from Indiana and um, there was actually a rehab facility right across the street from uh, where I was the crisis director and many times the clients would come in and they because maybe an insurance issue with a drug and alcohol place they would come to us and or and they couldn't get in and they said well tell them you're suicidal and they'll admit you or you have a plan and they'll admit you and it became like this kind of versus between the psychiatric program versus the drug addiction now I'm, today i'm happy to say that they're actually both combined now and they're actually one entity but before it was always you go to one to get your psych stuff and you jump across the street to go get your drug addiction stuff and but they didn't really mix and if you go to the drug addiction place and you say and you say that you're suicidal they'll say we can't help you because you're, we don't feel like you're safe here go across the street and then they would come to us and they say well i don't want to go to the psych hospital because i'm not a, i don't have psychiatric issues I have a drug addiction issue. So it really puts the person, when you talk about integrating healthcare, where we really couldn't help the person because they, we couldn't split the person in half. I mean, we're still talking about a disease of the brain. And so again, so this, the client is kind of left in this conundrum of how do I get this help and, and what comes first regarding my treatment? So again, if I say I've tried to kill myself, I won't get help if I go to substance use treatment. And they say, well, a lot of clients will come into now some of our treatment programs and they'll say to those that are doing admission saying this is my last chance and a lot of times that means that if, like if this doesn't work then i might as well be dead or this is this is it's over for me and in drug and alcohol there's a, a chance that people relapse many many times and it's something that we have to have that conversation when coming someone is coming and thinking like this is it or else uh, or maybe they don't want to talk about it in treatment at all. Like, let me not bring it out because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to be judged. Even if I'm in a group of other people who are struggling with a drug addiction, I don't want to say that I've either thought about ending my life. I've attempted to end my life. Uh, I don't know if I really want to live anymore. It's a really heavy conversation to bring up. The contacts that people have in toxic relationships, sometimes people get into rehab and their you know, families love them. They're saying either do it or else and uh, they're in a toxic relationship and maybe they get a divorce while they're so it sends them on the spiral of saying now i'm in treatment and i've heard testimonies of people feeling like they were going to end their life now because of it um so again all these kind of things are going on in that person's head you know i'm only suicidal, suicidal when i'm drinking um i don't want to be judged all of those barriers that a person kind of contemplates before coming into a rehab center they're still carrying that suicidal crisis as part of that and it's important that we create a safe space for them Please go ahead. So on the other side of it, um, the administration uh, piece of it, the healthcare side of it, um, there's this notion of if somebody comes in and they're quote unquote too high high risk, I was like, if you had a suicide attempt in the last 24 hours, oh, we, we can't bring you into our treatment center. Or say you go to a psych facility now and you get behavioral health treatment and now you're stabilized while you're sober and well, now you don't meet criteria to come into the hospital, basically admitting, it's like, well, what are you gonna come in? We've already detoxed you for, why would you come to us? Or you're coming straight from a psych facility, oh no, that person may not be appropriate to us. So again, too high risk to step down. Again, in the, in the rehab center, there's a lot of, um, there what we call ligature, which basically means there's tie off points. Uh, it's not secure, you're, it's a voluntary treatment as opposed to a psychiatric hospital with typically uh, people are either put on some type of hold um, by the police or something of that nature where for our you can come in and leave uh, the program obviously there's a uh, parameter set but it's a voluntary service and they also know that if something happens to a client who becomes more high risk for suicide uh, the notion is well if we if they go out the site can we bring them back and how we can we keep them safe so all those kind of things that are people contending with uh, go ahead to the next slide so this is an interesting study too that I want to point out. It's just fairly new. And again, it really focuses in on substance use disorders and people who are dealing with suicide risk. And they did a large sample. So we're talking about 2000, over 2000 people between suicide deaths between 20, um, uh, 2000 and uh, 2013. And this was across eight integrated healthcare systems uh, that had people who had been membered there or enrolled in their healthcare plan for over 10 months who had died by suicide. And what they did is they controlled for, um, meaning uh, they controlled for 
um, the SUD disorder specifically, basically adjusting out education differences, psych diagnosis, other health conditions, and really focus on how does the substance use that a person has differentiate them, or how does it impact their risk for suicide once you control for all these other factors that may differentiate. And so they had some interesting findings, uh, which I think are significant. Um, again, just having SUD significantly increases your risk after you control for psych and health conditions, which we always think they're all combined. But if you just have the standalone as an SUD, it automatically, anybody who's gonna be struggling with an addiction has an increased risk for, uh, for suicide. And the more substances you have, this includes tobacco, alcohol, uh, opiates, you name it, any drug that you can think of, the more that you have, the more risk that a person may have. And what was also more interesting that the relative risk for suicide was higher for women when they had multiple drug addictions. So, you know, I'll cite my sister. My sister did smoke, she did drink, and she was struggling with an, and she was struggling with an opiate. Even though traditionally women, we don't think about them dying by suicide at a higher rate, but this particular metric was higher for women than men. And we do know that there is a difference in gender uh, help seeking, where women are less likely to go out and seek treatment for SUD services versus men. So men typically come to SUD programs and rehab at a higher rate than women, about almost three to one. And the reverse is true for behavioral health and psych hospitals. So it's an interesting conversation to talk about what does that mean socially. So go ahead. So again, I think I can't talk about uh, this topic without mentioning uh, some of the contextual risk factors that go along with that. And contextual means uh, not the thing, not the person, because again, we always seem to kind of go back to the notion that um, depression specifically uh, or a, a diagnosis of a mental health condition has to be, it's, it's a mental health issue. But in actuality, there's a lot of factors that go on in someone's community that might increase their risk for suicide. So we're talking about contextual risk, right? everything from social isolation to having problems on your job. Think about having legal problems. You go through a divorce. We talk about our kids as this is being the second leading cause of death for, for our young people. Lots of bullying, family history issues, uh, relationship problems, again, sexual violence, any, uh, suicide clusters in the community, stigma that we have around getting help at all, getting access to a gun, um, getting a gun is easy, um, getting access to alcohol, uh, anything we put on um, uh, the media about unsafe portrayals or glamorizing suicide can increase risk if that's something that person's exposed to, someone's cultural and ideas and beliefs about the notion of suicide and what does it mean, is it a noble act? Um, and then, of course, the other one that is up top, adverse child experiences, basically how much trauma have you been exposed to as a child um, can increase your risk, violence in the home, divorce in the home, drug use in the home, um, sexual violence and so on. Those contextual risk factors that a person doesn't show up with naturally, but are just surrounding them uh, can increase risk for suicide. And these can, things can happen as to any of us at any point of our life. Go ahead to the next slide. Now the personal risk factors, again, are also important to talk about because those are the kind of the things that either we're born with essentially. Um, again, and that could be, hey, I had a family, my sister passed away. It could have been my grandfather, father. When you have some, a family member that has died by suicide, you are also at higher risk for suicide. Uh, being a foster child, uh, not any fault of your own, you're a foster care child. Um, and, but your risk is higher. LGBTQ, that population has a higher risk, you know, and again, uh, part of those elements of, is the notion of feeling supported by a community is really key here. And when you have an absence of that, your risk goes higher. A rural resident, just being born in a place where you don't have maybe access to immediate help or supports. So being out somewhere, uh, in the country where you, it's hard to get to a provider, hard to get to a doctor, hard to get to somebody that may to talk to, you at higher risk just by your location. Our black youth are at higher risk. Think about the Black Lives Matter movement and what's been happening there about the notion of what's happening on the news media and how do you interpret that as a black youth? So we've seen increases in our black youth suicide deaths. History of self-harm, being an older white male, American Indian, these kind of things, even having a recent diagnosis, terminal disease, these kind of things lift our risk for suicide. Um, next slide, please. So again, I mentioned all these things so that we can kind of talk through what it means to 
have understanding risk factors. So with any disease course, just like that I'm talking about heart disease, just like I'm talking about the diabetes, whatever it is, breast cancer, think of it th that way. All of us has risk factors based on our environment and our biology that put it at higher risk. We can say the same thing when we talk about suicide risk. Uh, so again, you continue to go on through these. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, two different aspects of it uh, to kind of give you not only that, but warning signs. So like, for instance, if somebody's having a stroke or there's warning signs of droopiness of the mouth and so on, um, the slurred speech would tell me that the person might be having a, um, a stroke. Um, uh, so mood states are being one of those. So if you want to go ahead and click through the rest of these two, I can bring them all up on the screen. I'll just go right through them. So for the sake of time, again, this is something to remember. So if you're thinking about your loved one, again, so this is education for everybody and for all the people that are provided, you probably heard these before when some people talk about is path warm. I refer to an acronym called death wish. And it basically means, do you want to die? And that means depression. So these are mood states, extreme mood swings, anger, um, trapped, feeling like there's nothing else that, that you can do, the hopelessness feeling there's, that things will not get better. So these are our mood states, uh, signs that you would want to look for in somebody's mood. Um, because imagine a person struggling with the idea, this is not that I want to die. This is I want the pain and suffering of all of those things that I just named in the former slides, maybe to end or change. And I don't feel like I have an answer. And it could be anything. Um, and that's the mood state that I'm feeling. So I'm struggling with my mood. I'm struggling uh, with feeling like there's nothing I can do, feeling like I don't have hope, feeling like I'm alone. And then behaviors that coincide with that are the withdrawal. I'm you know, pulling away from everybody, uh, having ideation. Hey, you know what? I don't care if I live or die, stuff like that. Um, increased use of drugs. Again, I'm struggling with some of these negative thoughts. So I start using drugs and alcohol more. Uh, and of course, having history of attempts and gestures as well. So those would be behaviors that I could look at and say, hey, that person wrote a note. Um, that person's using more drugs. That person's withdrawing from everyone. I need to ask a very important question to you right now because I'm concerned knowing about your context, what you've been through. Have you ever thought about wanting to die or kill yourself? Let's, let's have that conversation. And that's when you need to ask this like, hey, this person's having a stroke. Their, their face is drooping and their slurred, slurred speech. Call 911, it's similar to that. We need help, we need an intervention right now when you're seeing these signs. And it's okay to go ahead and ask, you will not cause this person to get into a suicidal spin, if you will, just by asking them. Are they gonna be maybe upset, agitated about it? Absolutely, uh, that's very much possible. And we're gonna talk about things you can do to help a person get through suicide crisis. Um, so uh, I have this other concept too, because I know we talk about warning signs, risk factors, but this is something that I also train the staff to kind of think about. If you look at the left as kind of being where the skull is death versus hope and life. And three factors I want us to be kind of keeping in mind. Uh, the first one being kind of sad appraisal, which is basically how do I conceptualize life events? When life is hard, what's my level of resiliency to be able to bounce back from it? And some, some of us, you know, always look down, things are always woe is me, that kind of thing, uh, especially as things compound. We have a tendency as human beings, we'll tag every negative thing, what we see on the news, our personal life to just feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, again, that alone doesn't mean you're gonna end your life. Uh, then this idea of moral conscious, uh, which was taught to me as well. So it's a notion of the awareness of doing good. Um, the idea, again, it doesn't mean that you're good or bad, uh, this is, there is absolutely no character flaw whatsoever. It's a, just a notion of the value of seeing who I am, the notion of how risk, how much of a risk taker I'm going to be. People who use drugs and alcohol tend to be, especially multiple substances, tend to be higher risk takers. Again, just because I'm a high risk taker and I like to live free and I don't have that moral kind of compass to say, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to hurt anybody. I wouldn't hurt myself. There are people like that. If that's kind of a lower threshold for you and you combine that with a lot of life stressful events, in addition to the last one here, you can click on having access to a lethal mean could put somebody in actually into um, a, a crisis. At any point, though, all of this is salvageable. Every person can be pulled away from this. If you would help somebody through therapy with adjusting their perception on life, that's why we do SUD treatment to help them feel like they have a community. Uh, developing the sense of resilience, 
and moral conscience meaning like responsibility connectedness to your community connected to your group that you're with there the women that you're in group with the men that you're in the group with uh, maybe it is your family uh, it could be beyond that the aa community is a big one and ideally saying you know what i need drugs and alcohol i need guns and weapons out of my home out of my excess and we're going to have that conversation with you to pull you away from the suicidal crisis and into a place where you have more hope and more strength and more resiliency and you can stay safe. And that's really the goal of what we do in treatment and any conversation that we're having with somebody to help move them into a safer space that allows them to overcome and have a better story of life and hope. Um, so this, this is where suicide becomes preventable. One of the important initiatives too, that I'm just showing this sli slide is about the elements of, of zero suicide. And I would encourage you to go online, look at this if you're not familiar with it already. And uh, with an organization that I work with, um, suicide prevention has to come from leadership. That's where it's a cultural change of understanding that this is something that we can do about, that uh, uh, can make a difference in. You know, whenever you have a healthcare system or any community of any kind, uh, it's the leadership that steps up and says, we're gonna do something about this. We're gonna make a change in the community. And the same thing happens in healthcare systems. We're gonna train our staff. We're gonna have confident, caring workforce. We're gonna to talk to our patients who are at high risk for this issue and find out how we can help them and engage them, talk about suicide risk, improve our policy and procedures through continuous quality improvement and always get better as a working community to have this conversation. Uh, so please, you know, if you haven't familiarized with this and I would encourage anybody who's working organization to reference these, they have a lot of great tools there. Um, so again, I told you I want to talk about kind of managing the risk um, a, even stronger. And I talked a little bit about some of the key points that come up in treatment, um, but also about how to, again, to build those protective factors when we're talking about that former slide is learning that you're not alone. And this is specific to SUD treatment. Again, when somebody comes in, we have a safety plan with everybody. We're talking about removing lethal means, drugs, alcohol, firearms from the home to make sure that they understand that at that one moment when they were really struggling, struggling, how can we change um, the trajectory so they don't have access to something lethal that could end their life? It's one thing to have an attempt and survive. It's another thing that you don't have another chance. And the less lethal, uh, the more likely we are to, to help that person. So learning that you're not alone, really connecting that person to uh, purpose. And these go with all of it. This is all about enhancing life. Suicide prevention is all about enhancing a person's life. And all these things listed here, any of us could use to help defend ourselves, strengthen ourselves about how to give back, finding supports, connecting the family, problem solving, and so on. So these are, and there are many more, um, but these are the type of things that you would do, do in a rehab center to help work on building that fortitude, not only continue to so your sobriety, but now we're also dealing with any suicidal crisis and so on, any, any thoughts that you might have. We've built these things in. Uh, we practice them in treatment so that you feel uh, stronger coming out of treatment and that you have access to help when you leave treatment. Please go ahead. Um, so here's a couple more examples and I see some questions coming through, which is great. Um, so this is an example of what we call a collaborative safety plan. And again, for the general public, again, you may have not seen this before, but those people in practice see this quite a bit. And one of the things that I found in working in SUD centers is, again, they're not too versed many times uh, on the how to manage suicidality um, when you're dealing with somebody with SUD. So the notion of contracting for safety, uh, like, well, they signed a no safety or a safety no harm contract when they came in. So therefore, we've checked that off our list of suicide prevention. Well, no, that doesn't really work. This is what's called a collaborative safety plan. And in it, you'll see various elements that is designed to sit down with that person at every person and go through, let's talk about when you're having a crisis and it could be related to their drug use, but let's come up with a plan right now. And with, so we know that when you are struggling at a, any given point during the treatment, you could he be here for 30 days. This is what we're gonna pull out. We're gonna reference this to help you get the help that you need and to help you manage it. Uh, and we're gonna partner with you on it, who to get for help, you know, who are the people, who are the resources and really outline it. And this person holds on to that and they take it with them. And ideally they engage with other people and create that supportive community. 
Um, so again, this is intended to be pro, pro, uh, uh, collaborative. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to reference this. Uh, so SAMHSA uh, has put this out too <coughs> as well. Pardon me. Um, so this is what's called a treatment improvement protocol. TIP50 is specifically designed for this. You can look it up online. There is a, a good 27, 28 page essay on this. And this is a design that I use with one of my healthcare systems to help the staff be trained on what they needed to do so they could get comfortable with um, managing somebody who had suicide risk. And we taught them how to document based on this recommendation, this protocol. Um, and as you can see, there's a decision tree when somebody has warning signs and risk factors at the time of entry, what should I do? I need to gather that information, um, getting assistance. So the notion is I'm gathering the information, finding out what the warning signs are. So I really understand what's going on with the client before they come in. The A means I'm, accept I'm accessing now my supervisor to consult. I don't do this by myself, but I have a concern. Um, Susie came into me and said that, you know, she was having thoughts of wanting to end her life. She's going through a divorce. Um, you know, she's very tearful, you know, so let's have this conversation. I'm going to reach out to my supervisor. It's like, hey, <clears throat> what can I do? What are the action steps? Then we take responsible action based on what's going on as a team and give that back to the client. Um, and it could be anything from, okay, well, let's monitor her closely. We're going to update the treatment plan. We're going to make some phone calls. We're going to update her safety plan. Uh, we're going to put her on a, um, a more frequent check, if you will, as opposed to every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes. Um, if, we, if it is really serious and this person has gotten to the point where they have a plan um, and, they're, and we feel like we cannot support them safely because the environment itself maybe have a risk built within it, it may be a good idea to transfer them to a psych facility. But the notion, if you do that, you want to extend the support. So it's not like, hey, they're going to talk to me about it and buy, get out of the door. It's we, we need to make sure that you're safe. We're going to stabilize you on a psychiatric unit for X period of time. We're going to consult and coordinate with, um, with the social workers, psychiatrists, physicians, whoever you're seeing there, and come up with a coordinated plan to find out how we can now bring you back once we've managed the suicidal crisis. You can go to the next note. So here's kind of an example of what that would look like in a real case here. So, you know, from a progress note, so Fernando comes in, he's a Hispanic male, he's a veteran. So we're talking, okay, risk factor. Again, this is personal risk factor, his age, um, his race, he's a veteran. Okay, so he comes in for alcohol and opiates. So, okay, there's another risk factor. He has missed groups now for therapy sessions, 10 days. Uh, the situation occurred and substance use clinic with the hospital. Okay, so that's kind of the background. So we gather that information. We find out he comes into our clinic now for, uh, for an outpatient. He hasn't shown up for a while. His breathalyzer is, is blown. He's got a 0 0.08. So we know that he's been using. Now he's saying, I'm, I'm using heroin. And then he said, reported that he held a loaded rifle in his lap last night with, and he was high and he was drunk and he complimented suicide. So that tell, that's our information. That's the risk picture, knowing what's happening what the, the risk factors he's walking in with and the current situation. So now I'm going to call my supervisor, Janice, and we're going to determine like, hey, listen, he had, this was pretty serious. He was thinking about suicide last night. So let's, now let's take action, take the right action, which is we're going to call in hospital security, maybe it's the police, whatever resource you have to help make sure that Fernando gets from point A to point B safely. Notice the extend the care. Now, Dr. McIntyre, he's at the emergency hospital. We're calling the physician. We're talking about what's happening with him. And now he's waiting for an admission. So we would do some follow-up for him to make sure that he's okay. And ideally bring him back in the treatment when he's ready. Go ahead. So again, I can't stress this enough. It's everybody's job. So again, this is another example slide that I use to train staff on. And um, um, I try to communicate that it's everybody's job. So the admissions team, what they do, the psychiatrists, what their jobs are, our RV, RNs and our LVNs, you know, registered nurses, um, licensed vocational nurses, BHAs, our behavioral health associates or behavioral techs in some places, what their job is, what the case manager's job is and what everybody's job is, including the people working in the kitchen, who if they've got a concern, we teach them to raise your hand and say, hey, I'm really concerned about X person. They might share something with somebody and it's okay to speak up and have this conversation because they're in our care. So it's everyone's job 
uh, to help support someone, especially when they're coming to a rehab center. Um, so again, some supportive strategies just for the people that are um, um, in the community. Again, I want to say, you know, ask with care. Don't be judgmental. Um, it's really important that you remind them that they're not alone, uh, especially if you're, you know, talking with somebody who, has, who uses drug and alcohol and they're having suicidal thoughts. They're not the first person or they're not the last person. And there's other places, there's places where they can get help and they should get help. Uh, remember, remind yourself that suicide is preventable. Um, that you're not alone, so you're not fully responsible for that person. You're there, you're one person. Reach out for help, involve another person, ask that person, say, who else can help me help you? Even if that means I'm going to go with you to a treatment provider uh, and I'm going to check in with you and we're going to come up with a modified plan, if you will. Uh, this notion of referring to services, there's some, a lot of studies out there or some training out there called QPR, which means question, persuade, and refer and some training about how to become an expert in that. And of course you have the 1-800-273-TALK line, which will be uh, 988, um, the shortened version uh, in come of July 2022 and big gratitude for the people who put all the work together to make that change. For programs, same kind of thing, but a different strategy of how we work as a team. Starting with leadership, training everyone on it. Uh, don't think that you just because of rehab center that you need to only talk about drugs and alcohol, you need to also talk about suicide prevention because every patient, because of the nature of what we do, that's part of what we need to assess for as well. Uh, it's like, it's just as important as taking vitals, just as much as we take somebody's blood pressure, we need to be talking about where they are. So consistently every day have this conversation with somebody. Uh, it's just part of everyday procedures. And that's the piece of it. We've got to put ourselves at ease and say, this is just what we do as practice and we're here to help you. And it's okay if you've had suicidal thoughts, it's absolutely normal when you're having this kind of crisis to, to feel that kind of way, but don't let the stigma be a part of that. Go ahead. So again, uh, so these are the programs that I mentioned to you as well. Newport Beach, we've got like uh, 42 plus uh, beds there and the Riverside, it's a big 10 acre campus out there. Um, if you'd like to find out <clears throat> about how to get more help, you're welcome to call or check out our website. Um, we take people from all over uh, the country into our programs. And so I'm really proud to work with this team who's full of people who are compassionate. Some are in recovery themselves. Some of them are attempt survivors themselves, uh, but is there connect a purpose to help other people? And I'm proud to serve this group of people um, who are doing great work in such a beautiful place. Um, please, next slide. Uh, if you wanna know more about uh, me, if you have questions, you can email me uh, or you can hit my website. There's an email link in there as well. Um, I wanna make sure that um, I get to people's questions. Um, so however we want to facilitate that, I'll allow it and we'll, we'll, before, we, before we exit. So you can Wonderful. get to the next slide if you'd like to. Sure. Oh, great. Just be Some mindful references. of time. I'd like to get plenty of plenty of time. So I just want to call out a couple of these two. If somebody wants to take a screenshot of this, please take a picture, whatever you need to do. Uh, I would definitely encourage if you are in the field to do the calm training It's counseling on access to lethal, lethal means It's that second bullet point. Um, I ask all my counselors and staff to do it just so they get familiar with having that conversation about access to lethal means. And then there's a plethora of resources. A lot of the stuff that I showed you today is from these websites. And then the two uh, studies that I cited especially about the men and women difference. I think there was a question about that that came through I saw earlier. Uh, please check those out. They're available to the public. public. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, so I'm going to ask my uh, United Survivors teammates to come back in if you are able to, and we can get some of the conversation going. Um, I wanted to start off with, um, you know, like you were talking about earlier with the bouncing uh, clients back and forth between uh, different types of facilities, one that treats behavioral health, one that treats substance use and never really finding um, a place. Um, your message here gives me a lot of hope that the integration is really starting to happen in earnest, but I still think upstream, the training is separate, the yeah. messaging is separate. What are your thoughts on like strategically how we can integrate this work better from, from the very beginning? Well, I, again, to your point, we have to have the conversation from the very beginning and that's what we failed to do. So um, what I found has been most effective is number one, what we do together as this group is telling the story. 
because we'll talk about suicide, but we won't talk about um, the drug addiction and the suicide and how they coincide. I've had some beautiful stories about people who have made suicide attempts and programs, and we've managed it effectively. Uh, and what I mean is that person got the help they need and we brought them back in. And that is really where the hope and healing begins. Um, so you need to have, and again, I think I put a slide up, but have a plan. Uh, and, and this has come up, having a prevention plan for every program and intervention plans for what it happens, when, what do you do when it happens? And then a post-vention plan and train every staff to it. Since I've been in SUD, there has not been one agency that I've dealt with that hasn't come through from CARF uh, to the Joint Commission who has asked me to show me, say, show me your suicide management plan, show me your staff training, what are you doing about it? And it can't just be, oh yeah, we have everybody sign a suicide, you're a no harm contract when they come in. So for me to get the message across for, uh, to the employees, two things, talk about the story, normalize it, because I guarantee you there's more people in that room who have experienced suicide. And then talk about it like a set of vitals. Like it, like the nurses seem to respond when I say, well, they'll say, oh my God, that patient's cutting themselves. And I said, well, think about that as, as you would talk about with their drug, right? Because they're using it as a coping mechanism. So have that conversation just like you're talking about. So tell me what does it mean to you when you're having these thoughts or what does it mean to you when you're harming yourself, right? As opposed to the fear reaction that we tend to get. And we do need to, that's why the suicide risk stigma, we need to calm ourselves down and realize that's part of the human experience when you're struggling with, with addiction. And that's the message we got to convey to every program at the very beginning. Um, uh, it's really well said. And I just also think like all the way into our graduate training programs, mm -hmm. yes. you know, I had very, very minimal substance use uh, okay. training in my graduate program. And now you realize it's it's everywhere. Of course, I, it was like an optional thing that I could go visit a 12 step program like that was it. Mm -hmm. um, very, very minimal. So um, I think we need to go all the way back to the beginning of, of where we start this conversation and integrate it more fully. Uh, Sarah, Rick, do you have uh, questions or questions you saw from the chat that you want to bring up? I can just I can tell you I relate with Dr. Rollins. Uh, I've worked in the SUD field for about 21 years and I remember when I started off as a treatment technician and somebody bringing somebody in and telling them, they, nope, you can't come here because you have mental health issues. And they've, we've been to the mental health hospital. They said they can't help us because they have substance use disorders. And I think those silos are coming down. And I, I, your, your presentation and discussion and breaking down that silos, I think is very important tonight. So thank you thank for you. sharing that. I saw a comment in here, thank you, Rick, about the men and women. Uh, it says, when I asked women why they were hesitant to seek SUD treatment, they often cited judgment of mothers specifically. They stated that men are seen as being good fathers by getting help while they felt that people thought that women should never have allowed themselves to develop SUD. It's very interesting and so sad. And I think we do have different expectations in gender about help seeking for men and women. And they're different. Like I said, in psychiatric facilities, we do see more women but for, for um, not an SUD so much. And I have theories about that too. I'd love to do more research on it, but my thoughts are, again, typically in SUD, the treatment is much, much longer. So the idea of being away from your family and you've got kids for 30 days or 60 days, it's tougher. And traditionally the world of SUD has been designed for men. It is founded as a men's fraternity. And that's to, by its history. And we have not undone that for our women because the women had to take care of the kids. The men would be the drinkers or drug and alcohol. So that was the foundation of it. And unfortunately, uh, the, the women's issues, as we saw it, the notion of hysteria and stuff that we would just reconcile to women has been prejudice or pinhole for women in that arena. So that's the place for women. But it's unfair because we're underserving both populations quite frankly, because of the gender stereotypes that go on. Again, that's in theory, but the foundation of both of them, you know, it's like, which place are you welcome to? So anyways, I think it'd be a wonderful thing to unpack that um, and ideally break some of those barriers down. Um, I see Brian, another question. I, I go do ahead. have a question for Sarah, you. Please. If I remember correctly, and I might not, but I think I do. Um, there was some research that showed that suicidal intensity actually preceded the development of a gambling addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really interesting 
thing to think about in the context of folks with substance use disorders. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen anything that really looks at that. I haven't as of yet about the, because um, I, I, I measure about 50% of our clients who cl come in and because I look at pretty much every assessment that comes through, have some kind of suicidality. Um, and, but what's underneath that is typically some kind of trauma element as well. And that to me is the underroot of most of the suicide crisis, of the SUD crisis that we're seeing, um, including gambling and so on, that there's trauma elements. If you do the research on the ACEs, uh, you're gonna find a whole lot there behind you know, and social determinants of health and those kind of elements that actually play into that. So I think suicide, suicidality um, is in many cases triggered by trauma um, at an early age among some of those other factors I talked about here today. But I, again, that's why research is so important. I don't think we use enough of it to inform practice. Um, so I have a lot of questions and I always wanna go back like, I'm gonna go do a research study, but then I miss the actually application of it. So I try to go read it and go like, oh, let's see if we can study this here and apply it. I think that's where the beauty of meeting the two uh, really makes a difference. Well, we have a question here from Kimball. Um, they wanna know, do you have any traditions around the holidays that honor Amber? Oh man, that's my homie right there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Um, you know what, um, you know, I light a candle for her just as a memory and uh, to celebrate her. The other tradition, of course, is she, she has a daughter. Her name's Khadijah. I'm gonna give her a shout out. Uh, she actually wrote chapter 10 in the book. Um, so she's somebody that um, means a lot to me. So we always talk about her. It's, it's one of those things where we get together and we just talk about the fun things that we miss about her. And sometimes we role play about how terrible she used to sing or her stupid dances that she did. And just to keep her memory alive because she always brought so much joy during the holidays. Um, so, you know, we'll call or even before the holiday specifically, like she just called me last week and she's, I dyed my hair like, like mom. Right. So, and that's always a nice thing. Um, so anyways, it's a way that we share and talk about our stories together, the Christmas pictures, all that kind of stuff. It's just a nice way to remember her. Mm, yeah. My brother nice died uh, December 7th and his birthday is Christmas Eve. So the holidays yes. are really hard for us too. Yeah. And uh, we honor him in many ways, but one of the ways is he loves shrimp. So we always serve shrimp on Christmas Eve. Um, all right. So Stephen Frost comes in. Hey, Stephen, so glad you're here. He's part of our workplace suicide prevention and postvention committee. He does a lot of great work in the construction space. Um, and he's got a, a number of things here. He talks about workplace culture that drives substance use disorders. It's just part of the culture or, or the stoicism, right? That then leads to self-medication. He also talks about the connection in construction be between um, physical pain and yes. the need to, uh, and then that leads to opiate prescriptions that yes. lead to, to, yes. to addiction. Can you talk a little bit about workplace roles in, in kind of this cross-section between substance use disorders and, uh, and suicide prevention? Yes, absolutely. So you have, again, you have to make a, it, again, this, this boils down to leadership and, and just to be perf perfectly honest with you. And I think people who are administrators, um, we're talking, especially now more than ever, um, when workplace um, uh, violence has been, been brought up a lot more, the workplace stress has brought up a lot more. We need, it needs to be a requirement within administration that we are creating employee assistance programs that are actually fully active and we're referring people to get help because people need help in the workplace. And sometimes the work is seen as an escape. However, there comes a point that sometimes work is, you can't function well at work. I have been there myself dealing with my own grief and loss of saying I could just kind of check out of uh, the day-to-day -day world and get into work. I was like, oh, this is not working anymore. This is a time for me to get help. So we have to do more to be caretakers in the workforce. And I'm so glad that you guys do. And we're, well, I shouldn't say you guys, because we're part of this too, um, uh, do about suicide prevention in the workplace, because it is about suicide prevention in the workplace is about enhancing the workplace to, to really make it a, a healthier place to be, that we're having support. That's really what we're talking about here. That's suicide prevention in the workplace. Um, so again, we have to be able to check in with our employees, um, be more sensitive to them, providing better time off. Gosh, I mean, everybody works themselves into the ground sometimes. So, and when we have job loss or we're unable to perform our jobs, we, you know, we, we are really hard on ourselves. So again, it's hard to give a clear answer to necessarily that, but again, I can guarantee you it starts with leadership and the kind of culture and the work atmosphere that you create for your employees. 
Wonderful. Any final thoughts for us, Marlon, before we go to close? No, again, I just be cautious about, you know, doubling down on the stigma. And um, I, I just want to encourage people to ask if you are concerned about anybody. And matter of fact, um, I was reminding my team about giving gratitude every day, and this is a season of giving. And so I would encourage you as a random act of kindness um, is to give your time by asking somebody, are you okay? Make that your gift by checking in somebody. Make that your gift, make that your tradition that you just check in on people, call four or five random people and do something kind. It's missing from our community. And so that would be my um, final word for this holiday season is to check on somebody, um, especially if you know that they've been having a hard time this year. Thank you. That's a perfect way to close at this time of the year. Let's give the gift of kindness. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marlon. Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you for bringing your community into this conversation so that we can all start to get to know each other better and share these kinds of discussions. Thank you to the entire United Survivors team for making tonight such a success. In closing, we have a next um, month's webinar planned for you. And for the first time ever, it's going to be done entirely in Spanish. Um, we are really trying to push the boundaries here of, what, of how we usually do stuff in suicide prevention. And so um, we will have a panel um, of folks um, facilitating a conversation on mental health promotion and suicide prevention in Latin communities. Key considerations, join us January 18th at 8 p.m. Easter time. More to come. Uh, so grateful for all our participants tonight. Um, thanks for coming out and we'll see you next month.